The Lord be with you. Good morning. It's so good for us to continue to be together in community today. Uh, I'm thankful for this new season. Um, cooler weather. Paul, the berries and Paul's bread have changed. Um, I'm thankful for the many gifts of this day, but most of all for the gift of this place, especially in this uncertain time. And I'm so thankful that Caitlin is back with us today. You all who have been here before know that you're in for a treat today. And so it's my pleasure to turn it over to Caitlin Hubler, who's going to pray and then lead us in our discussion. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you, Carmi, and thank you, everyone, for having me back. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, we come before you today in need of your presence, in need of your guidance, in need of your wisdom for what it means to be faithful in our current circumstance. We ask that you would bind us together in the study of your word and that you would give us guidance in how to discover and respond and root out the idols that are in our current context. We ask for your guidance and humility as we do this difficult task and trusting that you will give that to us. In your name we pray, amen. amen. All right, so thank you again. Oops, I think we're getting back. Might be a choose your own adventure today. Um, okay, all right. Today we are continuing our series on idolatry in the Old Testament. The first two sessions we talked about theories of idolatry, what does it mean in the ancient world to worship an idol, or what are the status of images in the ancient world. Last week we spoke about uh, the second commandment and what does the prohibition on graven images mean, what did it mean in ancient Israel, and what has it meant throughout Jewish and Christian history, and we saw some of the differences in Protestant and Catholic understandings. Today we are really delving into the monarchical period of the Old Testament. So anybody that ever, you know, memorized all the kings of Judah and Israel, this is your time. Like you've been waiting for today. So we're going to be speaking about how acceptable worship practices changed and shifted throughout Israelite history, specifically during the monarchical period. And then next week, we're really going to bring it home in talking about the prophets' response to idolatry and then thinking more about how we can take some of these different approaches in our current context. Sound good? And I always, as I always say, I like to ask questions and hear from you all, so don't hesitate to raise your hand. Um, we're going to see where the Spirit leads us today. So I talked about the monarchical period is where we're focusing today. Before, right before the monarchical period, there is a uh, particular narrative in 1 Samuel that is really interesting to think about when we talk about images, and that is that of the ark narrative. So if you are somebody that's reading the second commandment, the prohibition on images, you might be surprised to read in the next few books in 1 Samuel that there is an object by which people receive uh, medical ailments, they get tumors, they, uh, this object kills other gods, like disarms them, literally makes their hands and head fall off, this really happens, <laughs> and kills people when they look at it. You remember how in the Pentateuch, traditionally if people look at God, they die because they're not able to behold that uh, holiness? So there's an object in the Bible that has all of these same effects that God seems to have. And that object is the Ark narrative. So we'll do a brief kind of 50,000 feet overview of what happens in the Ark narrative. You can read this at length in 1 Samuel 4 through 7. But basically this is what is going on. So Israel and the Philistines are battling typical. Initially, the Philistines are winning, so the Israelites decide to bring the ark into battle with them. So this is your first clue that this object is playing some sort of a divine role um, because it's being brought into battle in the same way that a divine image in the ancient Near East would be brought into battle. You remember we talked about God napping the first week. People would take 
divine images as part of conquest. It's also true when you enter into battle, you would take your divine image. So the Ark is playing a, a similar role in that, in that sense. When the Philistines see the Ark of the Covenant, what they say, their response is, quote, a God has come into our camp. That's in 1 Samuel 4, verse 7. Not sure if they're being sarcastic or not. I honestly don't know how to read that. Um, you can give me <laughs> your thoughts if, as you're reading that. But what happens is the Philistines win still, and they capture the Ark. But this is the beginning of their trouble. So they put the Ark in Dagon's temple, which is a Philistine god. And that's when the Ark wreaks all sort of havoc on Dagon. Dagon falls on his face in reverence before the Ark of the Covenant. Super weird. His head and his hands fall off. And so the Philistines end up sending the Ark all around to their different locations. Each time, they're trying to protect Dagon from it, basically. But everywhere they send the Ark, it does something else. It wreaks some other kind of divine havoc. So I mentioned like the tumors that people get. It's almost like the plagues in Exodus all over again. But it's associated with this Ark. So eventually the Philistines are like, we don't want any more of this Ark. It's caused too much trouble for us. So they send it back to Israel, and then 70 Israelites look at it, and they die, okay? Because people end up, what people say is, who can stand in the presence of Yahweh, this holy God? And that's said of the ark. So it's a little bit complicated to think, how does this kind of narrative fit in with what we've been told is orthodox Israelite worship, no images? Does this count as an image? Are the people that are... Uh, in, that are responsible for producing the Ark or producing the graven image prohibition or they, do they see this as a conflict? And there's been lots of different ways that the traditions of Judaism and Christianity have sought to make sense of this seeming uh, tension throughout the ages. So there is one response that says, look, this Ark narrative clearly originally was talking about an actual divine image of Yahweh. And what has happened throughout the centuries of transmission and redaction is this one little Hebrew word, Aron, Ark, has been inserted so as to transform an originally, originally a story about God napping, very standard in the ancient Near East, into the Ark narrative. That's one way of thinking about the history of this story. Another way, which takes, it, uh, takes the text more, at, not at face value, but in terms of its final form, looks at it and says, it, it, it encourages us to make a distinction between aniconism, which you remember is the aversion to using images in cults, and the lack of divine presence. That is merely because there's a prohibition on representing God doesn't mean that God isn't present. And in some sense, it complicates or it makes more slippery God's presence because it ends up showing up through these mediatory objects, much like the Nehushtan that we read about last week in Numbers 21, this mediating bronze serpent that God uses to heal. And so I, I bring up the Ark narrative because this is a really good story to illustrate that Images are not one thing in ancient Israel. They were understood to perform different functions. And for whatever reason, this ark and what it could do didn't seem to be in conflict with the prohibition on graven images. So whether that indicates that it was changed, the narrative was changed so as to reduce that tension, or whether the authors didn't see it as conflicting with the graven image ban, the Ark illustrates that God is still present even in, in an aniconic context. This is not yet the idea of like omnipresence that we have later in the Christian tradition, um, which says that God is present at all times and all places. I've heard people talk about that God in the Old Testament isn't omnipresent, he's polypresent. So he's present at all these different places. Uh, which is interesting to kind of hold in tension with the ideas in the ancient Near East about God being located in the temple, right, in, in their divine images only. So I just share that as an interesting case study when we are thinking about images in the monarchical period. Any reflections or thoughts, things that stick out to you?
we'll keep going. <laughs> Another fun stop on the road of the monarchy <laughs> that has to do with images is Jeroboam and his golden calves. Good old Jeroboam. So as you might remember, the kingdom divides around 920 BCE. Jeroboam is now in charge. Um, and what he does is uh, decide that we need to have more cult centers that are essentially closer to people's houses. So if you read 1 Kings, people talk about uh, the Deuteronomist as the main writer of not just Kings, but uh, uh, 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings. And so there's a similar, what they call a Deuteronomistic ideology uh, at play in these texts. And the main distinguishing element of this Deuteronomistic philosophy is that worship should only happen in Jerusalem at the temple. We don't want any of these cult centers in the countryside, these bemote. We don't want you worshiping with a, with a sacred stone. We don't want you worshiping in your house. You need to come to Jerusalem, to the temple, because that is where Yahweh is present. And so when the Deuteronomist speaks about the actions of Jeroboam in 1 Kings 12, he's quite, quite critical of that, because what Jeroboam is trying to do is set up these cult centers at Dan and Bethel. You see how far up north Dan is. So prior to this, or I should say, what, the, what Jeroboam is countering is the ideology that one would need to travel to Jerusalem to present offerings to Yahweh. So this is actually making it a lot easier for people to worship, at least in the mind of Jeroboam, presumably. So whenever we have an uh, instance of uh, what's called idolatry in the Old Testament, I'm always interested in what specifically is wrong with it, uh, what is the thing that makes it illegitimate. And in Jeroboam's case, at least as the Deuteronomist sees it, there's something wrong with this project to dispense with Jer Jerusalem as the central cult place something to do with lack of national unity when you have these different places. You can understand why someone might make that argument, but you can also understand why Jeroboam might have felt that it was important to have these different cult places. So the cult centralization is one piece. The other piece is the two calves of gold. Now we've already spoken about bull imagery in the Old Testament and the inherent ambivalence around whether it's the calf that's representing God or whether God is invisibly seated on the calf in a way that could presumably be an iconic. These are questions we don't have the answers to. All we have is the record of the Deuteronomist saying this is bad. We can presume to guess that it might have had something to do, or it certainly had something to do with cult centralization. And it certainly had to do with the means of representation, the two calves of gold. But beyond that, we aren't sure. But the point that I take from this for modern day idolatry and how we think about this is that, and I think it's one that's very apropos for us, is that theology and politics are not separate. They're very much intertwined. And certain theological positions seem to entail political positions and vice versa. So this is not a world in which you have a separation of church and state, right? So idolatry is frequently conceived of in political terms on either side. Any reflections or thoughts on that? Yes. yes. Well, I imagine yeah. that the priests in Jerusalem didn't want to see their powers scattered through the lands. Mm -hmm. The treasury would be suffering because of that. So there were a lot of strong impulses to stamp that sort of thing out. Absolutely. I mean, whenever you have these kind of political squabbles, economics, is not far behind as part of that. It's always a factor. And when you have these this triple <laughs> combination of theology, a theological position, a political position, and economic incentive, these debates become all the more uh, filled with tension, as you can imagine. So thank you. Yes. yes. Uh, question. So is Jeroboam just king of Israel or is he king of both? Or what's the so I should clarify, this is just after the division of the kingdom. Jeroboam is the king of the north only. Right. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't want people to have to cross the border to Jerusalem. Right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's trying to, make, a sympathetic reading would be he's trying to take care of his own people. 
He doesn't want them to have to travel so far. And I mean, if you live near Dan, gosh, it's going to be quite a journey for you to make it down to Jerusalem and offer that sacrifice. Right. And I'm sorry, how yeah. often were they expected to worship in Jerusalem? Is it weekly, monthly, or, or is that not? That's, That's a good, good question. I know there's a yearly festival that they're expected to attend. I, it, for certain groups of people, I think it would, be, would have been more frequent than that, but at the very least, yearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Yes, yes, please. I suppose there are other theological differences. Oh, of course. Yeah, if you read a little bit further in First Kings, you see much more theological differences because we have the uh, Elijah versus the prophets of Baal whole shenanigan <laughs> debacle. And in general, the north, particularly during after the division of the kingdom in the 9th and 8th centuries, is very Baal-friendly, you might say. So Jezebel's name actually means, where is Baal? All Hebrew names have their really theological statements. And so when the Deuteronomist tells you Jezebel is the name of this uh, king's wife, Whoops. he's telling you something important about where her theological sympathies lie, which is especially interesting when you compare her name to Elijah's name, which means my God is Yahweh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's really the entire conflict between North and South that's summed up in just those two names. Okay, let's go ahead and, and move on. So Hezekiah, you probably remember him as one of the good guys, if you grew up in Sunday school. <laughs> At least according to the Deuteronomist. He's really good because he gets rid of all of the bad ways of worshiping. That is the, uh, the matzebah, the pillars, the sacred poles, the Asherah. We talked about Asherah, the goddess, last week. We'll get into that more. And, oh, our little friend Nehushtan, remember, bronze serpent from Numbers 21, because people started offering sacrifices to it. And so, remember, First Kings is told through the lens of the Deuteronomist, who wants to centralize the cult. Uh, so he's very sympathetic to kings that are in pursuit of that goal and help the cult become centralized in Jerusalem. So that's a location question and it's also a manner of worship or things objects involved in worship question and what is very interesting when we look at the things that hezekiah got rid of is that a lot of these things seem to be okay in earlier forms of israelite worship so things called the high places if you read the prophets the prophets are really hate these things too the bamot they're just open air cultic sanctuaries where you could offer sacrifices uh, usually it would be more local to one's area you wouldn't have to travel to Jerusalem but you would do similar sort of sacrifices that you would perform at the Jerusalem temple just out in the open air um, these high places were also targeted because frequently the things you needed to make them were two things a sacred stone and an Asherah pole now Asherah you, you know, again, if you grew up in Sunday school, bad, super bad. Um, sacred Sunday school. <laughs> <laughs> well, and trust me, we'll get to that. <laughs> there may be interesting ways that Asherah has persisted even in the biblical literature. We'll talk about that. Yes, yeah, Asherah, sorry. That's a very important aspect. So yes, um, I'll hold my little spiel on that till we get. Asherah is a goddess, okay. yes, and a uh, cult symbol. So she's originally in a personified goddess, a fertility goddess. She shows up all throughout the ancient Near East as Ishtar and different um, manifestations. And she also shows up in Israel mostly as the depersonalized cult symbol version of herself. So no longer is she seen as a goddess in her own right in the same way that like Baal is seen as a personified god but as her tree symbol so she's kind of like de she's turned into a, a mere symbol which happens a lot with gods in the ancient Near East they flip between being a person and being a symbol but they it doesn't mean they're less powerful so yeah part of the reason that these high places were not liked is because Asherah poles and Matzebah are part of them 
But these matzeba as well are not always seen as something idolatrous in earlier periods of Israelite religion. In fact, our very own, uh, I think, Jacob, yeah, sets up a sacred stone after his dream at Bethel as like a memorial to the encounter with God that he had there. And so early in Israelite religion, these unmarked, uncarved stones either didn't seem to be incompatible with the image ban or the image ban was not in the minds of the people that created or uh, built up these sacred stones. So within the scholarship on Israelite religion, there's a real confusion on how to understand the status of these stones. They're present really all over the world uh, in the ancient world as well, we don't really know how to interpret them. Some, some people say that they're supposed to be divine, uh, markers of divine presence. There is some truth to that because we see them in altars a lot of the time. Uh, but it equally is the case that sometimes they seem to mark somehow the worshiper's uh, presence in the holy space. They might be a sort of aniconic marker for the divine presence. It's difficult because uh, there's a scholar that that uses the term material aniconism to describe the standing stones. Because on one hand, you could look at this unhewn stone and think, this is veiling the, the particular figure and form of the god. So this is a way that god is still like, protected from uh, the very particular gaze of the worshiper. But there's another way you could look at that stone and say, no, this is a very, this is an iconic representation of God in the sense that it is material, it is located in a particular place, and it seems to mark the divine presence. So to me, Matzeba or standing stones is the quintessential example of the fact that idolatry is in the eye of the beholder. Whatever it represents <laughs> is dependent on the assumptions that one brings to it and how you want to read that, that image. Thoughts or questions? Yeah, Paul. I would just say that, how is that really different from our altars? And mm. the answer that I would give is that it's not very different. Yeah. I mean, in our altars, God is, yeah. is present in a special way. Mm -hmm. And we talked a few weeks ago about how a lot of uh, Israelite religion scholars will look at the way that divine statues are present, for example, in Mesopotamia, and say, you know, a really good uh, parallel for that in Western Christendom is the Eucharist, particularly in more high church traditions, because you have this idea of the real presence of God present. And in the Catholic tradition, it's like the essential strips out the accidental uh, qualities of the bread and wine. And so God is really present and in a way uh, is able to transmute the material. And so these debates are absolutely still going on because we deal with the same issues of materiality that people have always dealt with. So I think it's worth drawing attention to the fact like things haven't really changed all that much. I see your hand. Well, uh, if you have a special place or a sacred place, somehow you want to set it apart from non-sacred places, so mm -hmm. you would want some sort of sign or marker or symbol or red door in an Episcopal church. Mm -hmm. It's a great point. If you really take aniconism to an extreme or a logical conclusion, the idea that there is no sacred space is kind of hard to deal with. And I think that's why we see, even in aniconic cults, the divine presence is still located somewhere even if it's in an invisible seat w around the cherubim, like is the case in ancient Israel. So again, we should differentiate this idea of not representing God from God is no, it doesn't mean that God is not present. It is simply a prohibition on particular means of responding or capturing God's presence. Yes? What about sacred everything? Hmm. In this sense, you mean that the divine permeates through all things, not and not as it's not merely 
Yeah, I think just like you have different thoughts about that today, you had different thoughts on that in ancient Israel. And that's why you see people like the Deuteronomist coming down so hard on the fact that you can't worship God in these high places because people were. And people were worshiping God in their homes using uh, figurines, as we'll see. And so it's, it's evidence that rather than, like, just because this is in the Bible doesn't mean people actually agreed with this. <laughs> In fact, it's probably the opposite, because he had to say it so forcefully, people were not in agreement. And so the debates were raging then as they are now. Yes? So I'm finding myself confused, <laughs> um, because we still, at, today, we have um, crosses on the walls mm -hmm. of our home, and we wear crosses, and people who are Jewish were the star of David, mm -hmm. and I... I've always thought of those as reminders of mm -hmm. presence, but I don't, I don't know as you're talking, I'm thinking, oh, maybe that's idolatry. I mean, you know, how do you make that distinction? And mm -hmm. so, I don't know. Can you just Some people that? would say it's idolatry. I wouldn't. I think that, well, last week part of what we talked about is the difference between the Catholic tradition and Protestant traditions and how we understand the graven image prohibition. So in the Catholic tradition, the graven image prohibition is seen as, a, as separate from the command not to worship other gods, which ends up in a situation where it's fine like to represent by means of icons. And there's this category of an icon that is like holy art, which prompts the worshiper not to turn away from God, but to come closer to God. And so in my personal faith, I think that's an important distinction. Although I recognize in the different ways the tradition has responded to material in the Old Testament, there is disagreement on that. And so what I do think is true, though, across our traditions is that part of what makes something an idol is both in the thing itself and the worshiper's attitude towards it. Those are both elements that come together to make either something an idol and something or something not. And one thing that the Old Testament tells us is something that was seen more as an icon in earlier periods, like the Nehushtan, the bronze serpent, or even the Matzeba, can become, can cross over that, that threshold into idol in later periods of Israeli history, which shows to me it's not so much the object itself as it, it sorry, as it is the mode of attention or orientation towards the object. And I think most liturgical theologians in the Anglican Communion would probably have a similar view on that. Except the Calvinists. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> what are you going to do with the Calvinists? <laughs> yeah. The thing that comes to my mind about sacred places, uh -huh. what is worship? Is worship our response in giving something to God? Mm -hmm. Or in the sacred place? Is that a place where we can receive something and not so much a place of worship? Mm. Right. Is the agency on our side or is it on God's side? Yeah, I think different traditions would weigh that balance differently, of course, in accordance with your, your views of divine agency and, and personal agency. But I think most traditions would, would assert that there are, both of those sides are important, however they would weigh it. Yes, Paul? I would just say that one of the things that I have sort of absorbed from my exposure to the Episcopal Church is uh, and this is kind of the Anglican way mm -hmm. is to think is, is to just kind of go to trying to get to a final answer is a fool's errand on this. Uh, that these are things that have to be held in tension. And you can mm -hmm. both you can both um, affirm that a, a, a beautiful altar where people have worshipped God for hundreds of years and you can think of the presence that you know, mm -hmm. all of those generations of people and you, you can affirm that you can also affirm that God cannot be contained you know, mm -hmm. that, um, you know that's kind of a lot of what our modern theology is mm -hmm. getting into this penentheism and grounded mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. and what does it mean what do we mean when we say God? What do we mean when we say God? Yeah, and how is God embodied? Right. And because, Augustine, yeah, hmm. I mean, that was one of his big things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great point. 
And I think that's where understanding the reasoning behind the prohibition comes in so key because that impacts how we think about idolatry today, right? If we see the fundamental kernel of idolatry as God cannot be captured, that's a different, that's going to cause us to identify different idols in the modern day than if we think the core of idolatry is I hate other people's religious practices, <laughs> you know? And so that's why I'm so interested in getting to kind of the core of this. All right, we got to get to Asherah because you guys, you're going to like it, I think. Um, yeah, we'll pass that. Okay, so I have some pictures here of representations of on the left, you have the goddess Asherah, who is a goddess all throughout the ancient Near East, especially in Mesopotamia, associated with fertility. She was often a female consort goddess to the god Baal, who, as we've seen last week, Baal and Yahweh are very similar. They have similar divine profiles, being associated with uh, less powerful people rather than being sort of the high god, particularly in early Israelite history. So Asherah is seen as the consort to Baal, and some uh, scholars think that in various places in Israel, Asherah was thought of as a female consort to uh, concert, consort to Yahweh, which is why you see examples of what you might call graffiti or iconographical art throughout ancient Israel that associate Yahweh with Asherah. So this uh, site that I spoke about a few weeks ago, Kuntilat Ashrud, a site that's a military outpost of the Northern Kingdom at the late 9th century, so during you know, the heyday of ancient Israel, a little bit before the Deuteronomist, but it's what some have seen as a visual representation of two figures that might be Yahweh and Asherah, maybe not originally, but somebody wrote a caption on top that seemed to identify these figures as Yahweh and Asherah. Um, however, I will still say that here, it's unsure whether or not the Asherah is the personified goddess herself or a more depersonalized kind of divine symbol, such as we find here on the right, because Asherah poles were also a very common symbol throughout the ancient Near East. So we can sort of read backwards through things like Kuntel et Ashrud, as well as the warnings against Asherah in the prophets and the Deuteronomistic history to say that this certainly was a figure who was important in ancient Israel, even though the biblical text doesn't maybe want us to think that. So one way that we know this is archaeology. It, it's so fascinating to read about archaeological discoveries in the last 50 years because there's so much that's been unearthed that tells us about what was going on in the ground of ancient Israel. So you have these things called Judean pillar figurines. We don't really know what to call them. We don't know if they represented gods, if they were trinkets, uh, but they do seem to somehow be associated with a female divine power. And so it seems, based on the way that they were made, that there was a real explosion of their production between the 8th and 6th centuries BCE. So among folks, particularly in Judah, the south, which is supposed to be better, according to the Deuteronomist, remember? He, he likes the south better. But even the south would, would have their figurines. And so they were found both in homes and in tombs. They seem to have particularly been associated with women's worship. Uh, so they were found in areas in which women had typically more agency in the religious culture, right, of the home. Um, interestingly, a bunch of them go away at the end of the seventh century, which coincides with the King Josiah's rule. And if you read about what Josiah did, we are told very straightforwardly he gets rid of the Asherah and basically all the stuff that Hezekiah had gotten rid of, Manasseh brought back, and then Josiah was like, yeah, we're going back to Hezekiah's way, but we're going to do it right this time. And so that seems to coincide with what we see in the archaeological record. So whatever it is that they represent, whether it was the goddess Asherah or some kind of mediating power, Josiah and the Deuteronomists seemed to have seen them as a threat. And I don't have to tell you that the biblical text itself is not a fan of female representations of the deity conceived of as a, a personified deity. So, for example, you know, 
Yahweh doesn't have a consort in the biblical text. Like Yahweh is, Israel is Yahweh's consort in the biblical text, really. And that's part of why Asherah is downplayed in the biblical text. However, that doesn't mean that the feminine has completely dropped off of the divine sphere for the biblical writers. So has anyone heard of woman wisdom in Proverbs 8? So scholars theorize that woman wisdom is kind of a leftover vestige to the presence of Asherah as a divine consort to Yahweh. So in Proverbs, the whole of the book of Proverbs is structured as advice from a royal father to his son and just how to live life, how to do things. And there's a voice that shows up again and again through Proverbs of a female embodiment of wisdom, woman wisdom. And so she's always like, seek me, son. Uh, don't forget me. I'm important. And so we have a little excursus, though, in Proverbs 8, where she gives us some background in her own voice of her history with God. So I want to read a bit of this to give you a sense. So this is woman wisdom speaking in Proverbs 8. <clears throat> The Lord created me, we don't know if that word means created or acquired, I will say, at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts long ago. Ages ago, I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above. When he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was beside him like a master worker. That word also might mean child. Hebrew is strange. And I was daily his delight. Playing before him always, playing in his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. So where was wisdom present? What does all this imagery make you think of? The creation. Creation. Drawing a circle on the face of the deep. Uh, creating the skies above. This is creational imagery. So woman wisdom is claiming to have been present and in fact an active agent with Yahweh in creation. And this is similar to how Asherah is thought of in Mesopotamian myths. So even though the biblical text has a different way of understanding the feminine presence of the divine, one can argue that it is present here in this figure of woman wisdom. And we have a lot of beautiful representations of divine wisdom throughout the, the tr history of the tradition. I really like this one by Mary Plaster of her just holding this world. It really shows her agency in watching over creation. Later on in debates about Christology, it's very interesting, she will become invoked because uh, New Testament writers call Jesus the wisdom of God. And that's actually a reference to wisdom as a personified being in Proverbs. And so that her figure is part of how early Christians argue that Jesus is God, is because she seems to be some equivalent uh, form of the deity. So I wanted to make sure we talk about that because there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of like the Deuteronomist hated this, this, and this. But uh, the, the biblical text is multifaceted, and there's a lot of interesting sort of hidden gems that you might miss if you're not looking in the right places. So, any closing thoughts or questions on that? Yeah. It seems to me too that um, that the energy spent in not having an idol, um, it's much, it can be much more so than if you just got to think it, you know, that you're not worshiping them necessarily. Hmm. But if you've got to keep thinking that um, everything is, is a representation, therefore it doesn't count, Mm -hmm. then, then that's a lot of energy spent in, um, the, in the non then. I mean, mm -hmm. including, including those stones which were of God, mm -hmm. I mean, that were created by God. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot of energy spent on, yeah. um, and I'm sure there was, um, sure, yeah. making sure that it's not there rather than what is there. 
Yeah, and you're making me wonder, which I haven't wondered before, is the very preoccupation to root out these. We can't have X, Y, and Z because then people will get this conclusion about God. Is that itself falling into the very error that it tries to avoid? And so that's a really good point. Other closing thoughts? Well, we're right at 12.15. I'll let us go. I'm happy to stay after if you want to talk more, but I'll see you all next week as we talk about the prophets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As always, Caitlin has been really gracious to stick around for a minute. So if you have particular questions that are uh, burning and just can't wait for next week, feel free to ask her. Otherwise, we'll be together next week, same time for our final session together. Yep. Yeah. Too quick. So I know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.